All right, Boston Spot, time to get ready for our final unit test of the year. We just finished up the modern physics unit, and we'll do a, a quick best of here. We'll, we'll step through all the concepts that you should have learned in this unit, and we'll just brush up on some of the facts and equations that you should know for your upcoming test. Uh, first among them, there are only four forces in all of nature. And a couple of them we've learned about throughout the year, the gravitational force, that's the force between any two masses. That would be capital G, M1, M2 over R squared. And there's the electromagnetic force, which would be Fe. That would be K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. It is the force between any two electric charges. And then there are two that are rarely seen, except for in the uh, quantum or the nuclear world. Um, the first, and probably most important here, number three, is the strong nuclear force. That is the force that holds the nucleons together, and the nucleons are both protons and neutrons. So it holds protons to protons, neutrons to neutrons, and protons to neutrons. And the important thing to remember, it's incredibly strong, hence the name, the strong force. And it's also very short-ranged, meaning the force only acts over small distances. If you were to move the protons and neutrons further from each other, this force would disappear, which would be a problem for the nucleus because the nucleus is uh, all positive and neutral charges anyway. So since the like charges repel, the nucleus is not terribly stable. It wants to blow itself apart due to electricity, but thankfully the strong force holds it together. And the weak nuclear force, which you don't really need to know anything about, but it is responsible for radioactive decay. All right. In modern physics, which is also known as quantum mechanics, it's helpful to know what the term quantized means. And also to know what things in nature in this course are actually quantized. Um, so, the term quantized uh, means that uh, a quantity would come in discrete chunks or only comes in certain values, meaning it has legal and illegal values. So that should make sense when thinking about electric charge, because way back when we learned about the elementary charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And we also learned that all charges in nature must be a multiple of that number, meaning there are charges that can exist, multiples of that number, and charges that can't, which is any other number. And the weird thing about modern physics is energy becomes quantized. Uh, in the atomic world, there are certain energy values that um, things can have, and there are certain illegal energy values. If you think about the energy level diagrams that we studied, uh, only those stairs in a particular atom, um, only those levels are legal energy values. Everything else is a not legal energy value. Uh, we learned about photons. Photons are particles of light. So Einstein's concept here is that if you turn on your flashlight, it's not a stream of waves that come out, but rather a stream of particles. And he called those particles of light photons. The first equation on your Regents reference table helps you to find the energy of a photon. If you know the frequency, you multiply h times f. And if you know the wavelength, uh, you would do hc over lambda. That all happens because the speed of light is equal to the product of wavelength and frequency. Also, if you graph these quantities, it's a good review of graphing here. If we were to graph energy on the y-axis and frequency, you should be able to sketch what the curve would look like. And also, you should be able to sketch what the curve of energy versus wavelength would look like. Both of those are possible from this big equation here. So if we look just at the left two terms, E equals HF, that should tell you that you get a nice straight line when you plot E versus F. And the slope, the physical significance of the slope would be, you guessed it, that would be H, Planck's constant. And here where you're plotting energy versus wavelength, energy is in the numerator and wavelength is in the denominator. And we've seen all year long that whenever you have one in the numerator and one in the denominator, we get a hyperbola. So you would have this uh, decreasing, falling off hyperbola. You should also know uh, how to convert uh, electron volts to joules and from joules back to electron volts. In order to do that, I would do the factor label method. 
and the front page of the reference table tells you that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Uh, particle wave duality, as we learned in this unit, sometimes light behaves like a wave, which we learned back in the wave unit. It did things like reflection and refraction and dispersion and diffraction. It did all those things that waves do. And then in this unit, we learned that uh, light can behave as a particle. And the particle of light we call a photon. And each particle of light carries energy E equals HF. And whenever a particle and a photon collide, meaning light and actual matter, when they collide, both energy and momentum are conserved. Moving right along, uh, you should know about the Bohr model of the atom and the associated energy level diagrams. You should know how to read the diagrams with these energy values. Uh, you should know what the ground state is. The ground state is always n equal to 1. It's the lowest energy level that an electron can have. The electron is the, uh, the most captive of the nucleus at that point. Like it's the closest held to the nucleus. It's more difficult for that electron to get away, meaning to be ionized. And excited states are all levels above the ground state. So if you put an electron up in n equals 2 or up in n equals 3, those are considered to be, these are all considered to be excited states up here. 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, at least in hydrogen. This is the hydrogen energy level diagram. Ionization energy, these are the easiest possible questions. If you notice up here at the top level, which is known as n equals infinity, it's actually labeled ionization. So if the question said how much energy is needed to ionize an electron in the n equals 2 level of hydrogen, your answer is right there, but in the positive form. If you're sitting at negative 3.4 electron volts as an electron and you want to get freed all the way up to zero, somebody would have to add 3.4 electron volts. So... I like to think that ionization energy questions are the easiest questions. You're really just reading off the number here because that's how much energy we needed to be added to get you to zero, meaning to ionize you. The quantum world is very rigid. Electrons can only exist on the levels. If somebody, if you had an electron in the negative 10.36, the ground state, and somebody were to give you a gift of 10 electron volts, that would give you if you add 10 electron volts to negative 13.6, that would leave you at negative 3.6 electron volts. And if you notice, that is not a, um, a level here. So the answer to the question would be that energy gift would not be accepted by the atom and the electron would not excite. Nothing would happen. If you give an electron a gift of energy, it has to exactly land on a stair. And if it does land on that level, you would say that it excites to level you know, X wherever it goes. Electrons are not allowed to be in between. The second equation in this unit of the three is E photon is E initial minus E final. And you should know how to go from this equation all the way to determining color. That's a very important sequence. If an electron were to fall from three to two, you should be able to use this equation to get the energy of the photon that would come out in electron volts. You should also be able to convert that number into joules and using the first equation on your reference table, get that to frequency. And from frequency on the reference table, you can look up color. That's a sequence we've done many times. Mass energy equivalence. Einstein tells us that energy and mass are really the same thing and they're convertible back and forth between each other using the speed of light squared as a constant. So there are many examples where energy is not conserved and mass is not conserved. So whenever you're working a problem and it appears that mass is being created or destroyed, um, then you would use E equals mc squared to calculate the energy equivalent of all that. Going along with this equation, E equals mc squared, the fundamental source of all energy in the universe is the conversion of mass into energy. Right now, while our sun is generating energy for us. It is losing mass at an alarming level. So the sun is sending out energy and that comes at a very high price. It has to destroy its own mass in order to do nuclear fusion in order to send us the energy that we so enjoy from the sun. All right, some more stuff. On the front page of the reference table, there's 
a way to convert mass into energy without using e equals mc squared. They've done it for you here. One universal mass unit would turn into 931 mega electron volts. That's 10 to the 6 electron volts. So, so you should know that this conversion lives on the front page of the reference table and just do your factor label method. Make your brackets and make sure you're either multiplying or dividing as appropriate. If you look on the reference table, there's a table uh, called the standard, the particles of the standard model. And in that table, it lists everything that is fundamental in nature, meaning things that we believe cannot be broken into pieces. And we believe that the six quarks and the six leptons that are listed in the particles of the standard model table uh, are all fundamental, which leaves us with 12 fundamental particles in nature. Antimatter, every particle has an antimatter friend, and it's important that you know that when you write antimatter, there's going to be a bar over the top. For example, if you have a down quark, an anti-down would be a D with a bar over the top. Antimatter has the same mass as the particle, so you could look those up on the reference table on the front page if it's an electron, proton, or neutron. And it also has the opposite charge. What you don't want to do is to tell us that it has the opposite mass, like negative mass. It doesn't. It has the same mass as the original particle, but the opposite charge. You should also know how to build baryons and mesons, and that is clearly explained right here in the classification of matter table. If you're building a baryon, you're going to need three quarks or three antiquarks. And when you're building a meson, you need one quark and one antiquark for a grand total of two. So mesons are smaller than baryons because uh, the baryons have three quarks and the mesons only have two. And everything you need to build is right here in the particles of the standard model table. And the rule that you need to know for finishing building particles is when you assemble a particle, um, when you finish, it cannot have a fractional charge. Quarks can have a fractional charge, but when you put them together into particles, you have to finish with negative 2e, negative 1e, 0e, 1e, or 2e, where, of course, e is the elementary charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right, that really is the material. We'll try a few quick problems um, um, to just to, to practice some of this stuff, and, uh, and then we'll call it a day. So it says a proton and an antiproton come into contact with each other, and annihilation occurs. Calculate how much energy is released. So we have a proton and an antiproton. Proton and antiproton. These are two particles, and they get too close to each other, and they touch, and when they touch, pow, a photon comes flying out, and we want to know how much energy would be in that photon. Well, here's how you do it. First of all, when you do such a thing, matter would be destroyed. So here you have mass. And then after the collision, you would just have energy. And that energy would have to be equivalent to the mass. So you would run this through Einstein's e equals mc squared. Now, how much mass got destroyed? Twice the mass of a proton. So you would take that amount of energy and put it in, sorry, that amount of mass and put it in for m. And you would multiply by c squared, and that would give you the energy. And that would be the energy of the photon. And from that, you could find its frequency using E equals HF if you wanted to. All right, which combination of quarks could produce a neutral baryon? Well, first of all, if it's a baryon, it has to have three quarks, and they all do. Uh, and really, you would, it's just trial and error, some questions. You would have to look at a charm and a down and a top and add the charges together and see which one gets you a neutral baryon, which would be uh, zero E or zero coulombs, whichever way you want to write it. Uh, what that really means, if you think about it, in order to get a neutral baryon, you must have one from the top because everything on the top is positive two-thirds, and you must have two from the bottom because they're all negative one-third. And that would add to a total of zero. So um, if you run all the charges here, you would see that uh, the charm is up on the top, and the down and the bottom are both on the bottom row. So that one will get you to a neutral baryon. A couple more problems here. What is the net charge on an anti-down, anti-down, anti-down? 
So first, this would obviously be a baryon uh, because it consists of three antiquarks. And so what is the charge on an anti-down? Well, the charge on an anti-down has to be exactly the opposite of the charge on a down. So each of these guys would be plus one-third E, one-third of an elementary charge. So plus one-third, plus one-third, plus one-third, you would get to positive one E. Final question. Anytime you see universal mass units or MEVs, at least in regions physics, it's just going to be a conversion. So if we wanted to convert 2.014 universal mass units and you want to convert it into MEVs, you might have the question, do I multiply or divide? You never have to ask that question. If you make the brackets and you set the brackets up, so that the U's cancel, and you're left with MEVs, now you know how to fill the bracket in. You simply look at your reference table, and it says one universal mass unit converts to 931 MEVs. So then you know that you multiply. So you multiply those out, and you will be all set. So, hope you enjoyed the video, and best of luck on your modern physics test.